Hello, this is Dr. Turkawi. I'm currently an assistant professor at the Department of Anesthesiology Division of Pain Medicine, Stanford University. In this lecture, I will give you a, an overview about scientific manuscript writing and um, how to write for uh, high impact journals, a question that I commonly get. First, I would like to thank Dr. Sinani for giving me the permission to use uh, many of her materials um, in this lecture. Um, these materials belong to her class that she uh, teach scientific writing, HRP uh, two, uh, 214. Um, as of today, um, this class is free. I will uh, put the link for the class uh, at the end of my presentation. So in this lecture, we um, I will uh, walk you through steps to become a better writer. Uh, we we'll cover some principles of scientific writings, um, steps in the writing process and the skeleton of the research manuscript, and we'll wrap up um, and talk about how to publish in high impact journals. So, steps to become a better writer. First, attend classes and workshop. Um, read good manuscripts. Uh, this manuscript doesn't necessarily need to be in your field, it can be in other fields, uh, and it can be uh, even outside uh, uh, medicine. Um, pay attention and imitate. Uh, take, talk about your research. Um, uh, for example, present presented in, in a scientific meeting in your department, uh, uh, to your colleague, uh, even before trying to uh, write your manuscript. Try to engage readers. Try not to bore them. Um, practice, practice, practice. So as any other skill, um, practice is the key. The more you do, the better you become. Revise. Nobody gets it perfect on the first try. Learn how to cut ruthlessly uh, and never become too attached to your words. Find a good editor and take risk. Um, you're going to submit, you're going to get rejections. We all will get rejections. Principles of scientific writings. Cut the clutters, cut any extra words. We'll go uh, thoroughly about this. Um, verbs, know how to use verbs. Um, use punctuation appropriately. Uh, use tables and figures as much as you can. Uh, suggested order of manuscript writing. Uh, usually it's recommended to start by making your tables and figures, they write your result. Hopefully you have the method, the method uh, from before, but just rewrite it here again, and then uh, add whatever you, uh, you, you use and, and, or anything different in statistic. Then write your introduction, and then your discussion, then finally the abstract. Avoid and check for plagiarism. Um, I didn't add more detail about plagiarism in this lecture for time uh, consideration, but um, I bold it on red because it's very important and you have to check for that before your submission. Check the targeted journal guidelines uh, early on. And the key is early on because you don't want to finish writing your manuscript and you realized, oh, I need to cut a thousand words now. Um, so it's very important to uh, have an idea where you're going to submit it during the writing process. I will cover that in the next few slides. So let's learn how to cut clutter. Um, I like this um, uh, uh, phrase from um, William Zenser on his uh, 
uh, book, Writing Well, in 1976. It still apply. It's very nice summary, and, and I like every single word. I'm gonna just write it for you. I break it down to points just to make it uh, easier. The secret of good writing is to strip every sentence to its cleanest component. Every word that serves no function, every long word that could be a short word, every adverb that carries the same meaning that's already in the verb, every passive construction that leaves the reader unsure of who is doing what, these are the thousand and one adulterants that weaken the strength of a sentence. And they usually occur in proportion to their education and rank. So here is some common clutter. Uh, did wait words and phrases. For example, as it is well known, as it has been shown, it can be regarded that it should be emphasized that um, some empty words and phrases like basic tense of methodologic, important, long words or phrases that could be short. Muscular and cardiorespiratory performance can be fitness. Unnecessary jargon and acronym. Um, um, acronym is something um, very annoying when you read the manuscript and you uh, came across uh, an acronym such this that, that the author came up with. It's not standardized, it's not common. And then you have to go back and forth to figure out what they mean by this acronym, what they mean by this acronym. So avoid doing that. Um, repetitive words or phrases, studies, examples, illustrate, demonstrate, challenges, difficulties, also you need to avoid that. Adverbs like very, really, quite, basically, generally, try to avoid that. Example of long words and phrases that could be shortened. A majority of, you can simply say most. A number of many are the same, are of the same opinion. Agree. Less frequently occurring, rare, and etc. This is just a short list here, but you get the point. <clears throat> now, other tricks. <clears throat> Eliminate negatives. It's unclear and it will take more space. Not honest, just say dishonest. Do not remember, just say forget. Do not pay attention to, just say ignored. Do not succeed, failed. Eliminate uh, superfluous uses of there are and there is there was a long line of bacteria on the plate. You can simply say, bacteria lined the plate. Omit needless preposition like that and end. For example, the meeting happened on Monday. You can say, the meeting happened Monday. They agreed that it was true. They agreed it was true. How to use verbs, very important. And these are some general principles. So use active voice, use strong verbs and avoid turning verbs into nouns. Use past tense for complete actions, usually things um, in the methodology and results sections. So for example, we found that women were more likely to the average pain score was, and then use present tense for assertions that continue to be true, such as what the tables show, what you believe, and what the data suggest. For example, in the discussion section, and sometimes um, on the results. So for example, figure one shows, it still shows, so it's a present tense. 
The data suggest, it still suggests, we believe that treatment A is better than treatment B or whatever. Now, digging deeper on this, so the advantage of using active voice, it emphasizes author responsibility, it improves readability and reduces ambiguity. In our case, like here, the passive verb equal a form of the verb, um, for example, to be verb, and the past participle of the main verb. To turn the passive voice back to active voice, simply ask who does what to whom. Example, no attempt was made to contact none responses because they were deemed unimportant to the analysis. Were deemed, who did that? Um, look at this. We did not attempt to contact non-responders because we deemed them unimportant. General dysfunction of the immune system at the lymphocyte level is suggested by both animal and human studies. Look at this version using active voice. Both human and animal studies suggest that diabetics have general immune dysfunction at the leukocyte level. So great authors actually use we and I. Don't be shy to use we and I. Um, Use strong verbs. Um, use strong verbs, avoid turning verbs into noun. I will show you some examples and do not bury the vain verb. The WHO report that approximately two thirds of the world's diabetics are found in developing countries and estimate, so this is the second verb here, that the number of diabetics in these count countries will double in the next 25 years. You can simply say, so report that approximately, this is really estimates, it's, it's a strong verb and it, it just sounds better. Um, the WHO estimates that two thirds of the world's diabetics are found in developing countries and project. So project in this specific situation is stronger than estimates. So project that the number of diabetics in these countries will double in the next 25 years. During DNA damage recognition, that's a noun of, you know, this gene or whatever, by this result in um, recruitment, another noun here, of something here, and repression of the cell proliferation gene. Um, see how this will look like when you use strong verbs instead of nouns. So during DNA damage, this gene or whatever recruits this and this, which together repress cell proliferation gene. I mean, think about this. This is more clear, easier to understand, and to the point. Here are more uh, uh, grammatical um, uh, tips. So the word data is plural. So data are, is not data is. Um, effect is the verb to influence, and effect is the noun from influence. The class affected him. The class had an effect on him. That versus which is often confusing which one to use. That is the restrictive defining pronoun, which is the non-restrictive, non-defining pronoun. Example, the vial that contained her RNA was lost. The vial which contained her RNA was lost. 
more clear, ask yourself, is the clause essential or non-essential? So if it's essential, it's suggested to go with that. The essential clause cannot be eliminated without changing the meaning. While on the other hand, if the clause is non-essential, you can use which. So non-essential can be eliminated without altering the basic meaning of the sentence and you use commas with which. Example, stroke indices, incidents, data are obtained from sources that use ICD code. The clause here is essential because it is defining the subject. So it's better to use that. The deal with gender choice is always confusing and, and hard for the readers and take much space. So just turn to plural and use they and their. For example, he or she was asked to rule left. This is clumsy compared to we ask patient to rule left. Now, how to use punctuation? Um, first, you really need to avoid long sentences. Long sentences confuse the reader and it's hard to digest. So this is why we have punctuation. So know how to use punctuation. Uh, increasing power to separate uh, in the following order. Comma, then column, then dash, then parenthesis, then semicolon, then period. So comma indicates a small break in the sentence. It separates words, clauses, or ideas within a sentence. It can follow participle phrases that introduce a sentence. Example, a doctor canal blocks were thought to target the saphenous nerve, comma, articular branches of the obturator nerve, comma, the medial retinacular nerve, comma, and the nerve to the vastus medialis. While column used after independent clause to introduce a list, most commonly uh, most common use, quote, explanation, conclusion, or even amplification. It can be used to join two independent clauses if the second amplifies or extends the first. Example, the test is consistent of the following, and you start your list. That's one reason why I'm so optimistic about the future. Then column, I'm explaining why now, the constant churn of scientific progress. Dash, I like dash, uses to add, emphasize, or to insert an abrupt definition or description almost anywhere in the sentence, in the middle, at the end. Examples, finally, clinical epidemiology is not limited to academic physician epidemiologist. So what's, what's academic physician epidemiologist? Um, who are sometimes more interested in analyzing data than caring for patient, but provides clinician with the tools to improve their patient outcome. Another example, here um, we are using it at the end of the sentence. So about 700,000 total knee arthroplasties are performed annually in the United States. A number expected to increase to 3.5 million per year by 2030. Another example, at the end of the sentence, concise, Thoughtful writing makes complicated topics clear and understandable, dash, and will much enhance 
the impact of your work. Parentheses used to insert an afterthought or explanation can be a word, phrase, or sentence into a passage that is grammatically complete without it. Parentheses give the reader permission to skip over the material. Example, the nerve supply to the skin of the knee comes from the femoral nerve, obturator nerve, tibial nerve, and common peroneal nerve. Then, parentheses, the last two being branches of the sciatic nerve. So, are you okay if you stop here and you can pass that? Semicolon, connect two independent clauses, also used to separate item in list that contain internal punctuation. Exa uh, a, a clause always contains a subject and a predicate. An independent clause can stand alone as complete sentence. Example. The quality result were classified as follows. So here we use column. High quality, comma, further, insert, further research is very unlikely to change the confidence in the estimate of effect. So now you, are, you want to keep listing things. So moderate, there, there is a semicolon here, then moderate, then the, what is moderate? then um, semicolon here, then low, then that's what's low mean, and then semicolon here, and very low, and that's what's very low mean. So high, moderate, and then you are separating them using the semicolon because you are using commas inside that sentence or close. Um, another example, Adding obturator block to femoral or uh, to femoral or femoral and sciatic block improved their ranking for pain scores and opioid consumption. Semicolon. However, the obturator block alone was not even superior to PCA, patient-controlled analgesia. So. This, you can separate this sentence, and you can also use a period here, um, but you give, you are making it more uh, attached to the previous sentence by using the semicolon and period at the end of the sentence. Paragraphs, tips for good uh, uh, paragraph. So, one paragraph equal one idea. No more than five sentences in the paragraph. Sometimes you can make some exemption, uh, uh, exemption and you, you can add more sentences, but try not to exceed five sentences. Um, give away the punchline early. Uh, paragraph flow is helped by logical flow of idea, sequential in time, logical argument, parallel sentence structure, use and or but, and if necessary, use traditional words like especially, moreover, nevertheless, and finally. Readers usually remember the first and the last sentences best. Thus, make the last sentence memorable. Emphasize at the end. Avoid non-standardized abbreviation, acronym. This will distract the readers as they try to go back and forth to figure out what you mean here. Steps in the writing process. So, when you write a manuscript, usually you go through three phases or three stages. Um, the first stage is the um, pre-writing, which um, I, in probably take about 70% of your time and effort. Then the second stage is writing the first drive. This is very, hopefully, very fast, about 10% of your time. And then the revision take a longer time, which is the last 
state. So in the pre-writing, um, you're going to collect um, data, you're going to synthesize, you're going to organize information, um, you're going to brainstorm take-home messages, uh, work out ideas away from your computer, and develop a roadmap. And the writing, when you're writing the first draft, put together or put your facts and ideas together in organized prose, and then the revision, read your work out loud, get rid of clutter, do a verb check, get feedback from others, make sure citation inserted appropriately, and the manuscript follow the targeted journal style. So in more depth, tips for, tips for the pre-writing uh, pre stage, gather and organize information before writing the first draft, write on the go. Anytime you get an idea while you are eating, driving, etc., either write it down, use your phone, I use my note in my phone, or record it, it's up to you. Um, work out take home messages. Um, choose powerful words. Um, you can keep like a few nice words that you like from other manuscripts, uh, from your, like, like a small bank of powerful words that you can always use uh, as needed. When discussing a controversy, follow arguments, counter arguments, and uh, rebuttals. Um, tips for writing the first draft. Um, the goal of the first draft is to get the ideas down in a complete sentence in order. You do not need to be a perfectionist. Uh, focus on logical organization more than sentence level details. Your manuscript should sound like an attractive story. So ideally, you will introduce the concept in the introduction, then you get the readers excited in the methodology. They read your methodology, oh, they get excited, this is a great methodology, he's doing a good job, or they are doing a good job, and um, in your result, they get more excited, and because you have used uh, nice figures and tables, and you, you, you divide it very well, and then tell them how you reach your conclusion in the discussion part. Tips for the manuscript revisions. Read your work out loud. Cut the clutter. Do a verb check. And check punctuation. Get feedback from others. Get edit help. Very important. Do not be afraid of cut jargon, uh, acronyms, repetitive words, adverbs. Uh, check for numerical consistency. Tables, figures, numbers that appear on more than one place. You know, um, when I read a manuscript or when I review a manuscript, um, when I find that the figure number does not consist with the text number, you know, this really give a bad uh, impression about the author. And this is, I see it often, um, happen when you have a multiple authors doing multiple revisions at different times or you add another figure during the rev revision process or you add another table and you forget to update the text. Um, you really don't want to do that. Um, make sure citations inserted appropriately and the manuscript follow the targeted journal style. It's a very important to check the targeted journal style early on the stage before you reach the final manuscript uh, uh, draft. And check for plagiarism. Again, there are certain um, multiple software that you can use. Ask your library if you don't know. Uh, the skeleton of the research uh, manuscript. Um, so when you submit, when you upload the manuscript um, at the journal website, that's usually um, the order of how you upload them or how, how you, you, you do them. So start with the title page, which usually include the title of the research, the authors and their affiliation, then abstract introduction, method discussion, result discussion, figures, acknowledgement, references, and supplementary material. Um, however, when you um, 
write the manuscript you don't need to follow that uh, order uh, actually what's suggested to start with the tables and figures and then what is left over then write your result uh, reference your tables and figures and then hopefully you have the methods uh, beforehand ideally you know but you need to update some statistical things add more details so write it down uh, and then write your introduction then your discussion then at the end your abstract some tips for writing the introduction um, typically three to five paragraphs one paragraph long in word um, follow the conical introduction uh, concept so you start wide and you narrow it down the background what's known um, knowledge gap hypothesis approach and just to make it um, elaborate more here so usually the first paragraph is what is known then followed by what is unknown what's the limitation what's the gap of knowledge and then your burning question hypothesis and aim and your experimental approach why your experimental approach is new and different and important um, write to general audience avoid very technical terminology that no one else will understand except those who are expert in the field uh, summarize at high level, high level leave detailed descriptions uh, speculation and criticism of particular studies for the discussion the last paragraph can start with something like we hypothesize that we tested the hypothesis that the answer to answer this question we did this and this um, tips for writing the methodology um, here you want to answer who what when where how and why and give enough information to replicate the study so this is really the receipt um, um, of your study um, break it into sections and make it easy clear for your readers um, so suggested sections will be like materials um, the drugs you use the intervention you use equipment etc participants subjects animals versus humans did the rb approval study registration experimental protocol study design here uh, measurements in details how you did all your measurements the dependent and independent variables um, analysis how you manage the data how you what's the statistical test you use what's the software etc tips for writing the result um, use figures tables illustration diagrams movies be creative um, whenever you can uh, make it easy um, for the reader to understand and get your uh, messages um, figure versus tables shall I use figures shall I use tables you know figures usually um, has a visual impact show trends and patterns tell quick and whole story highlight particular result um, tables give precise values display many values variables um, i personally prefer always to uh, present my information uh, the information uh, in a figure and if i can do that then i will go to a uh, table um, any figure or table should stand alone so if you are using any abbreviation in the figure or the table make sure you define them below the figure and table in the ligand um, you don't need the reader to go back to the text to figure out what's this abbreviation mean make your figure clear and attractive use beautiful colors beautiful design um, use the appropriate type of figures this is another topic out of the scope of this lecture um, i can lecture on this in the future but there are a bunch of beautiful blasts and graphs and you need to know which one to use um, um, in the results section also uh, point out simple relationship describe big picture trend side figures and tables appropriately um, 
avoid duplication unless necessary unless it's, it's a very important thing very important message the main thing you can rephrase it in a different way than your figure and table um things that are difficult to present on the table or figure or uh, or, or, or figure like the leftover uh, the, the less important can be presented in the text of the result um, break the result into also uh, subsections um, and then tips for um, writing the discussion uh, now you invert the cone start by narrow then wide so start by answering the main question asked support your conclusion your data and by using your data and others define your conclusion anticipated criticism give the big picture take home messages um, the flow um, should uh, follow the following so start with the key findings answer to the questions asked in the introduction start with something like we found that or something similar explain what the data mean big picture state if your data or your finding um, are novel then um, follow that by the key secondary findings then the context give possible mechanism or pathways compare your result with others discuss how your findings support or change the, the paradigm um, strength and limitation make sure you write that anticipate readers question criticism focus on limitation that matter not just write down like right generalized thing so focus on limitation that matter um, explain why your results are robust um, then write a paragraph about when what next recommended confirmatory studies point out an answer question future directions and then wrap up with um, 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 so what um, uh, implication speculation recommendation give the big picture here implications of finding tell readers why they should care and finally conclusion a paragraph or conclusion that restates your main finding give a final take home messages um tips um so so tell tell it like a story right uh, again use active voice use past verbs when referring to studies details result analysis and uh, background research example we found that subjects may have experienced turkawi et al found you know um, use present verb when talking about what the data suggests example the greater weight loss suggests the explanation for this difference is not clear. Potential explanation include. Uh, finally, I would like to um, uh, emphasize a few citation rules. I, I see that uh, a common mistakes. Um, you should cite the most recent, best, and most relevant articles. Um, for fundamental observation, please cite the original reference um, don't cite the reference that cited the original fundamental uh, observation uh, confirm that citations say what you think they think um, it's funny sometimes you see that that someone cite an article that that article cited another article and they are all wrong because someone just cited an article wrongly and people keep citing that then when you go to the original article you find out oh that's not true so make sure that you, what you are citing is really true this is why you need to go to original articles um position the citation precisely uh, this is another uh, common example so for example um there is a strong association between intraoperative hypotension and myocardial injury this is a citation and if this is another citation and a weaker association between hypotension and acute kidney injury citation i have seen it sometimes like people add 
go to the end of that sentence and do like 26, 27, and 28. That's not the right way to do it. You really have to cite precisely. Um, now, how about abstracts? So tips for writing abstracts. The abstract should contain background, background of topic, typically one to two sentence. And in that background, add your question, hypothesis, and, and, and aim. Um, in the methods section, state the population studies, the basic methodologies in the study, experiments, and the statistical analysis used. In the result, list the key result, the number of subject studies, and the key finding, including point estimate. I think it's very important to put point estimates. Sometimes I see some abstract with the results that doesn't have any point estimate. They just put p-value or say significant. That's not enough. You want to show me some effect size, you can put the p-value. Um, if you are putting confidence interval and you don't want to put p-value, that's fine. The confidence interval will tell that. Um, and then in the conclusion, the answer to the question ask, take home messages, implication, spec uh, speculation, recommendation. Um, and please, um, uh, since few studies are really definitive, avoid claiming that you have proven that the theory is true or false. Um, so use words like may and suggest, right? Um, the abstract should give an overview of the main story, give highlights from each section of the paragraph. It's okay to copy paste, it's your text, and stand on its own. Okay, I'm gonna wrap up here with how to publish in high impact journals. Okay, first of all, let's define what's high impact journals. Um, so high impact journal is one where its articles are highly cited across the academic uh, spectrum. Um, a journal impact factor is a measure of the frequency with which an average article in a journal has been cited in a particular year, usually the previous year. A scientific journal with an impact for a, a factor of greater than 10 could be considered a top journal in most fields. Um, however, this is unfair to many uh, specialities. So, because it varies based on the audience of that speciality, how big is that speciality? So, for example, in, 2000, in 2021, the highest impact factor journal in cardiology was circulation with an impact for factor of 22, while the highest impact journal in anesthesiology, which is number one, is the anesthesiology, was the anesthesiology journal with impact factor is about eight. So is it fair to say because it's below 10, this is not a high impact factor journal? Of course not. That's, a, that's, a, that's the top ranked journal that specific year. So in my opinion, um, the top three to five journal, again, based on how big your specialty, if you have 30 journals, let's say the top 10 percent journal in your field, I would consider them um, high impact uh, journals. Um, now, the question is, is your study publishable in a high impact journal? So you will very much answer that question if you ask yourself, the following questions. Have you done something new or novel? Is there anything challenging in your work? Will, you res will your results influence other researchers? Have you provided solution to some difficult problems? And can your finding be generalized or it's specific to your population, your country, or your, a certain race, certain, you know, this, um, it need to be generalized. Is your manuscript well written? Is it clear? Tell a story, use a robust English. Then if you answer these six questions, then you can 
have an idea whether your manuscript worth going to high impact journal or not. And of course, ask expert, more senior people like you, they will, re they will guide you. Now, this is a general rule. So review article does not usually get published in a high impact journal, except, except if it is invited article. Usually what go to high impact journal is like something like original clinical trials, big clinical trials, basic transitional research, large database study, usually can make it. Now, I will wrap up with a few tips to write and publish in a high impact journal. So follow all the steps that I told you about in this lecture. Um, build your reputation. You know, it's very hard to publish your first research or the first few research in a high impact journal, unless if you are working with an expert in the field. So you have to build your reputation. You have to let people know who you are, what you are doing. And then generally, which make a lot of sense, funded studies from prestigious agencies like NIH, usually better perceived by high impact journals. You know how it's difficult to get an NIH fund. So when your study is NIH funded, that tells a lot. So the reviewers will feel more comfortable and trusting your uh, result. Work with expert, field expert, methodologist, statistician. Um, register and publish your protocol with the appropriate agency like clinicaltrial.gov. Uh, your study must be a high quality, high impact, and generalizable. Again, that's a key here. Um, ask senior scientists in your field. Very important. They will guide you where to go, where, where, where is the potential journal for you. Um, read previous articles from the targeted journal. Uh, know the journal audience. Write a good cover letter. Uh, this is very important. Say why you think the paper is good fit for your journal. And I'm going to alarm you um, uh, before that. Have your de-identified data and statistical codes organized and ready to share. It's not that common that they will ask you to your data, de-identified data or statistical codes to go over that. Uh, and I'm going to alarm you here. Be prepared for multiple and exhausting review process. It can be two, three, four, sometimes uh, revision. Finally, um, as I promised, this is um, Dr. Sinani uh, course. You can find it here and, um, and you can enroll, uh, you can practice uh, there. I highly recommend it. And I also highly recommend um, this uh, um, special article that was published a few years ago in Anesthesia and Algesia from um, uh, one of the two influencing um, and highly cited uh, um, uh, scientists in the field of anesthesiology. Um, when I see these names, I really enjoy um, reading and, uh, and get excited to read uh, their work. So um, thank you very much. Uh, don't forget to subscribe to see future uh, lectures.